Okay, so, um, so yesterday I was talking about modeling a language with dynamic allocation, and the way the, the story went was that we constructed an adequate model for the language, so a model which uh, correctly reflected the behavior of complete programs, um, but it wasn't a very good model because uh, there were lots of things which were distinguished in the model that weren't distinguished by the operational semantics, by contextual equivalence. Uh, so there were lots of valid equations in the language that we couldn't prove from the semantics we started with. So we took that semantics and made it better by quotienting it out by uh, this uh, slightly complicated logical relation. And uh, since that was a bit rushed and uh, the construction was a bit complex, I thought today I'd kind of amplify on the idea behind that sort of construction and give some simpler examples of, um, of the same situation, of taking a... Um, an overgenerous semantics that you start with, which is, is sound and adequate, but not particularly abstract, and then shrinking that down to give a more accurate um, semantics. And this is something that we do all over the place. Uh, so I guess the, I mean the, the most obvious example of this process would be if we wanted to understand a mod how the type lambda calculus worked um, starting from an untyped lambda calculus. So we could, so there, this is, a, this is the sort of ultimate uh, uh, idea of refinement because we start with just one type to start with. We would construct the untyped lambda calculus. We can construct a model of the untyped lambda calculus which distinguishes lots and lots of things which can be assigned types because there are lots of terms in the model that don't have types that can make those distinctions. And then what we want to do is for each type we want to carve out the collection of well-behaved things in the big model that are in that type. But the process is a little bit more subtle than just carving out subsets, because when we carve out um, our typed subsets, we also want to change the equality relation. So things that are distinguished in the big model, we want to, want to look in the big model, take out all the guys that have type int to int to int to int, but we also want to refine the notion of equivalence so that things which were previously different in the, in the untyped model become equivalent in the interpretation of one of our types. So um, to kind of see that in the, uh, in the simplest form, I think the simplest example I can give is, imagine I had a language which only has one reference cell storing an integer. So we know how, to, we, know how we ought to model that, um, and we will, we'll, we'll model it in the usual way with, uh, with a state monad. And in this case, um, it will be, you know, s goes to uh, s cross x, where uh, s is just uh, z, right? So storing the single piece of integer store. And if I build a model like this, um, then it'll be a reasonably, uh, reasonably accurate model for, for this sort of putative simply typed language with, uh, with just reading and writing 
uh, one location. But imagine I'd been really stupid. Imagine I had failed to notice that there was only one location in my language. And so instead, I had kind of foolishly uh, built my model like this. So I'm going, to, I'm going to make the store contain two integers um, instead of one. The programming language only ever talks about one of these guys, but the model carries around a state which has this extra component. Okay, so, so maybe this is uh, a bad choice of variables, but I can't stop myself anyway. Variables x and y. Okay, so if I do this, so I interpret, I interpret um, all the commands in my language using this monad with the state being slightly too large. The interpretation will be sound and adequate, but it will fail to prove lots of contextual equivalences which hold in the language I started with because there are things in the model that mess around with this extra variable that I gratuitously added which let you make distinctions. So um, I guess something like, um, uh, I'm going to give it a type. Um, 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 um. Uh, what should we call it? Okay, so... Um, Okay, so here's a here's a pair of uh, a pair of terms in, in my language, which only contains the one variable x. So this is a, a higher order function. It takes in an f of type unit to int. It sets what I believe to be the only location to zero, calls f, sets the location back to zero, calls f again. Okay, and the second term just sets the location to zero and calls f. Okay. Now. If f is any, progr any program that I can define in my language, it can only read and write the variable x. So uh, its behavior, when I call it the second time, all it, it sees the x component of the state, which is, is, is all it can possibly um, care about. It sees that as the, as the same. And so the value that I get returned from the second call will be the same as the value I get returned from the first call. So in my language, these two guys are going to be contextually equivalent. But in my model, these two guys are not going to be contextually equivalent because there are functions in there like um, sort of so semantically um, uh, uh, f equals whatever it is. Um, um, uh, uh, uh. Right. So so a function which uh, which increments the uh, the variable y and returns the value of y um, would distinguish between these two guys. Okay, so my semantics is not fully abstract because I've got extra stuff in there. And what I'd like to do is have an account of how I would simplify how I would quotient out the semantics to get a sound interpretation of the, of the terms I started with. Now, of course, in this case, um, the obvious thing is just to change this and write the sensible semantics in the first place. But often, there'll be, other, there'll be good reasons why I have extra stuff uh, in the model that I want to quotient out later. Um, and in particular, I mean, even, even this sort of setup is not totally unrealistic. You might imagine that my programs are going to interoperate with somebody else's programs, and the other person's programs have access to Y as well, um, and I want to understand what the conditions are for my programs to safely interoperate with theirs. Um, so there might be something in there, for example, where F uses Y in its computation. It comes from another language. It can see Y. It uses Y in its computation, but it promises it's, it's, it's soundly usable from my language because it promises that its use of Y is always encapsulated and not exposed to me. So how would I, how would I quotient this, uh, this semantics out? Well, sort of following a very simple version of the sort of thing I was doing yesterday, the kind of thing I would do is I would define a relation uh, which is indexed by the types of my, uh, of my language. I sure you shouldn't call them X, should I? Um, <coughs> and, uh, and this is going to be um, a binary relation on the interpretation of each type. Okay? So the relation at some base type <coughs> is just the diagonal relation. And similarly for all the other uh, base types. And for products, a nice, a nice pair is made of things which are component-wise rela related. Um, so x and x prime have to be in uh, R of um, A, and uh, y and y prime uh, are in R of B. 
Um, and for functions, um, I have my choices to whether I do the monadic thing, I'll do the monadic thing. So for functions, um, <coughs> this is going to be the set of pairs of functions <coughs> such that whenever you give them a related arguments, so good, good equal arguments, um, I apply the first function to the first argument and the second function to the second argument, I'm in what I'll write as T of um, uh, uh, the meaning of B, where now uh, T of um, <coughs> on some set, uh, um, I'll call this B, is going to be a subset of the, my computations in my language. So this is going to be a subset of uh, these guys. Okay, so this is going to, going to take two computations, and now these, these computations take in my big state and return my big state and, uh, and possible values, and I want to say what good computations are in, uh, in, my, in my world, and they are ones where, um, let's see how to put this, it says for all, um, so it's going to be, going to be a set of uh, uh, M and M prime, let's say, <coughs> such that, so this is going to be one computation, another computation, I'm going to say they're related, uh, if um, for all S and S prime, such that S of X equals S prime of X, so if they're equal on the bit of the store that programs in my language are allowed to, uh, to know about, <coughs> um, uh, M of S, M primed of S primed. So if I run the first computation in S and the second computation in S primed, I get back a, uh, a pair of um, results over here, okay, um, which I'll call, uh, uh, what shall I call them, S2 and uh, B and S2 primed and B primed. And S2 and S2 primed had better be, uh, have the, might be in my relation states, which I was writing differently, will have equal values at X. And B and B primed are in, uh, uh, whatever I was doing, get <coughs> the meaning of, the meaning of, meaning of B, um, this should be RB. Yeah, pass it now. Okay, so, so what I've done is I've, I've lifted all the type constructors up to operate on binary relations. So this is the, the lifting of, uh, of product to, to binary relations, and this is the lifting of functions to binary relations, and then this is the lifting of the computation type constructor um, to binary relations. And so now I can show that every program in my language has the property that... Um, Okay, if I use the other board, then some different people can't see. <laughs> but, um, so, uh, so I'll be able to show this, uh, this property that says um, uh, uh, that if I take the denotation of this term, Every term will be related to itself. So what I mean by R gamma entails A is that if this is, uh, this is like the lifting to, uh, to function spaces, it says if you give uh, this guy a context and this guy a context, and those contexts are pointwise related by the relations associated to the types in gamma, um, then uh, the denotational semantics of these two guys will be two things in the meaning of A, and those things will be related by the relation associated to A. So this squishes it down, and we will see that if you do that, then, oh, of course, I've long since wiped it off. Those two functions there uh, will actually be in the relation associated with the type uh, unit to int to int. Um, and because the relation co coincides with 
identity down at our observations at ground type, and everything's compositional, then, the re then showing that two things are related in this logical relation is, suffi is sufficient to show that they are contextually equivalent. Okay, so we squished the model down at every type. And the clever part was we had, to, we had to do something interesting for functions, you see, because we had to say that things were equal, uh, not equal at all arguments in the model, but at, it only had to be equal at um, all arguments which were in the relation associated with the, uh, with the appropriate type. So, uh, so this is a, a very common pattern, this idea of taking a big model, defining a logical relation which squishes it down, um, and giving, it, giving yourself a, a refined and more accurate model. So a particular example of that that I want to talk about today is a sort of fancified version of this, of this idea, and uh, this is to do with the semantics of effect systems. So, um, so effect systems have been around since, well, yes, mid to late 80s. And the basic idea is very simple. You take a standard type system for an imperative programming language, usually a call by value programming language, since we don't tend to have non-trivial um, implicit effects in uh, call by name languages. And we refine the type system. Ref we refine the syntax of, of all our judgments and types so that instead of just saying something has type int to int, um, we say it has type int to int and something about the side effects that it might have uh, whilst it's running. So the general pattern of effect systems uh, looks like this. So we'll have some base types and we'll have some function types and we'll annotate our function types with little mm. epsilons. And the idea is this is a function which takes arguments of type sigma, returns results of type tau, and along the way has effects which can be statically approximated by some effect annotation epsilon. And we can use this to track all kinds of effects. We can use it to track effects on the store, whether certain exceptions have been thrown, even things to do with concurrency. Um, so these will be our values, and the general form of typing judgment for a general expression, which might have side effects, will be some, some expression m has type sigma and effect epsilon. And uh, so what one of the standard rules that you'll find in all effect systems is this one. This is the rule for lambda abstraction. So, so this says if um, uh, gamma and x has type tau, lets you prove that m has type sigma and effect epsilon, then lambda x dot m has type tau to sigma with what's called latent effect epsilon, and itself has no effects. That's because this lambda abstraction is itself a value. So, um, so this thing just evaluates to itself without having any side effects. But the side effect of the body, this epsilon, has been pushed up above the arrow, and this is called the latent effect of the function, because when the function is applied, the body will, uh, uh, will actually be evaluated, and at that point, whatever this effect was, uh, will be sort of unleashed on the world. And, um, well, it doesn't take uh, uh, too much brilliance to spot that there's a strong connection between these effect systems that people have been using, so as I say, since the, uh, <laughs> the mid-80s, uh, and the monadic metalanguage that we've been talking about. I mean, not to put too fine a point on it, all the places where epsilons occur are exactly the places where t's occur when we do the call by value translation into the monadic metalanguage. It's fairly obvious, really. So um, we have types like int, air, ob, and t of a. When we do the call by value translation, if you remember how it works, when we translate a judgment here, um, we translate the, um, uh, the context, we translate the term, and that will have type t of the translation of sigma, where the translation on types is defined by sigma to tau translated is, that should have a, a star on it, uh, is sigma translated to t of tau translated. And the translation of a whole judgment, um, when, we, when we do this call by value translation, will look like this, and what we will see is here that the, um, uh, uh, the, uh, the typing of the expression has a computation type, and then when we do the lambda abstraction, we get something which is a value type, not a computation type, and then we will trivially inject this value type into the computation type that we need to be the translation of uh, general expressions of type tau arrow sigma, um, and so we will have a trivial computation t of type tau translate to t of sigma translate, and you know, this, this, this t here corresponds to the epsilon, and this, this val is a trivial computation which is going to correspond to uh, the place where we put the empty effect annotation in the effect system. So once you've, seen, once you've seen this sort of stuff, you start to think, well, what happens if we, uh, if we try and 
model effect systems using not just simple monads. This monad isn't tracking the particular effects that an expression might have. It's just tracking this big, all-encompassing collection of effects. Um, the effect system is giving us some refinement of the, uh, of the types of our language. So let's try and refine our effectful uh, uh, meta-language by having more than one monad around, some kind of refinement of the, uh, of the computation types. Oh, so there's the epsilons coming in in the right place. Um, so here's how, here's how this looks. So the idea is we're going to have a language where we have uh, 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 t's around just as we did before, but now we're going to annotate uh, these t's with epsilons, just as we do in effect systems. So, uh, so here's one of the interesting rules from uh, effect systems. This is the rule for application. So now in its general form, there's quite a lot going on here. Uh, if uh, m is going to be some computation of a functional type, and that computation itself has an effect epsilon. The function has a latent effect epsilon primed, and the argument has the right argument type, tau, and itself is an expression which has an effect epsilon primed. So the effect systems say, well, m applied to n will have result type sigma, and then, well, the effects it can have are, first you get the effects that come from evaluating the function, then you get the effects that you get from unleashing the latent effects that were buried inside the function. Oh, sorry, no, first you, that's um, uh, in the wrong order. Yes, so if you, if you care about order, then first you'll get the effects from evaluating the function, then you'll get the effects from evaluating the argument, and finally you'll get the effects from, um, uh, from actually running the body of the function. And there are various different sorts of effect systems. Most of them tend to abstract away from the order in which effects occur. So we regard these epsilons will be just sets of some kind of effect annotation, and we'll combine them in the let rule, in the um, application rule here, with, um, with just a union. We could be more accurate, and we could try and track the possible order in which these things come, in which case this would be rewritten, and there'd be some kind of, um, uh, some kind of uh, uh, concatenation, of some monoid operation here. So back in the monadic world, what does this look like? Well, it's a, fairly, it's a fairly straightforward translation of this, except that because we're being a little bit more explicit about the distinction between computations and values, we can really see the sequencing of evaluation. So here, is, there's an awful lot going on in one rule. And in the monadic world, things are split up a little bit more pleasantly. Um, so the, the monadic uh, um, thing that corresponds to this will be that M has type T epsilon of tau to T epsilon prime sigma. So that's the monadic translation of this um, effect judgment. Um, and the crucial thing you can see is that uh, the translation of this whole application will involve two of our let terms. So we will sequence together. We'll say let F be uh, evaluate uh, M in let X be evaluate N in F of X. And um, <coughs> so we get, we get to split the application down into three parts, the two evaluations of the, um, of the function and the argument, and then finally the application of the function to the argument. And the, um, the way the rule works is that, we, is that the let rule will union together the effects of the, um, of the thing that's evaluated and the, um, and, the, and the body, the continuation. So we'll just have one union for the let rule. And uh, so here we've got the, the let for, for n. So we've got uh, t epsilon uh, double primed here. And here we've got t epsilon primed. And down at the bottom we get t epsilon double primed union epsilon primed. And then this gadget down here has an epsilon. So we, get, we union that with that in getting the final, final result. So, um, so this is just a piece of syntactic munging around. It's, uh, 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 there's nothing very deep about it. Um, and uh, well, this is, this, is, uh, this is a 98 observation. So in 98, there were, there were three papers on, um, on doing effect analysis using refined monadic meta-language. So, um, and they were all slightly different. So, um, so Andrew Tolmach uh, wrote a paper about how you might um, uh, analyze and transform ML programs using a fixed hierarchy of four different monads with monad morphisms running between them. Um, for Wadler had a paper in ICFP uh, which described this, um, this syntactic process of the correspondence between effect system judgments that has, have been in the literature for a long while and this refined um, uh, monadic um, uh, presentation of, uh, of effect systems uh, for slightly fancier effect systems than this. Um, and, uh, and I and a couple of co-authors um, had a paper about our MLJ compiler for standard ML, which had an intermediate language which was based on the computational meta-language where the computation types were, were um, annotated just like this. And we used that for performing optimizing transformations in the, uh, in the compiler. 
So we have a, the, the effect system there is very simple. It tracks whether computations might read the state, might write the state, might allocate new reference cells, might throw particular exceptions, or might, uh, might diverge. And uh, so it's very useful to have this extra information about what possible side effects things might have because that allows you to perform more transformations than you would have done. So um, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, how we give semantics to, to these kind of uh, effect systems presented in the monadic style. Um, and before I, before I do a complicated one, I thought I'd try and talk about a simple one. <coughs> so it's going to be similar to this. <coughs> so the idea is we're going to have a, a really simple total language with some fixed set of exceptions. And um, so the effect system for that is kind of, uh, kind of easy. Let's see how we go. Um, so that, so the, um, the types of the language will have some, some bunch of base types. Um, we'll have uh, a type for exceptions. Um, we'll have uh, products. Uh, we'll have functions. And we'll just have them of, uh, of this form. <coughs> and um, the, uh, the typing rules for this are mostly fairly standard, except that we will have to have some type rules for exceptions. So. Um, so we'll say gamma says uh, uh, E. So we'll just have fixed global exceptions now. So, so E has type um, uh, exon. Um, and um, gamma says uh, raise uh, M. <coughs> um, oh, let's make it value E. So if, uh, if, if V is a value of type uh, exon, then um, raise b um, is going to be a computation of an arbitrary type. <coughs> um, and if uh, gamma says uh, m is a computation of type a and gamma says n is a computation of type a, then gamma says m handle e to N is a computation of type A. Okay, so, so, so we have some, some collection of exception values and we allow ourselves to pass those around uh, in the program. Um, th uh, if you have a, a value of exception type, then you can raise it and that's a computation. Um, uh, oh, yes? Where coming from in the second rule? Ah, anywhere you like, because um, you, so you can, type, you can type something that always raises an exception at, at any type, right? So, so every type is going to contain that. So, so um, so yeah, so, so raise v has type t int and it has type t bool and it has type t int arrow int, okay? <coughs> um, and the handling thing, we have, two, we have two, two computations which must have the same type and this thing will run, will run m and uh, if m raises the exception e, then it will run uh, n instead. So you'll get the result of m uh, unless m throws an exception, in which case you'll get whatever n does, which might itself involve throwing an exception, okay? So if we want to sort of effectify this, um, it's not very, uh, not very difficult. We'll refine the exception type itself. Um, so we'll, we'll allow this thing to, um, I'm going to run out of letters called E in this, but never mind. Um, uh, perhaps I'll use <laughs> functional programmers thing. So, so E's, so we've got um, a set, uh, so E will be range over uh, 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 exons and uh, E's will be a subset of uh, exons. <coughs> So, um, so we'll refine the exception type to, uh, to, to say what possible values it might have. So there's now a whole big uh, lattice of, uh, of, of exception types. And we will annotate our um, function types with a possible effect. And the possible effect uh, will actually also be a subset of exons. Um, so I could have got away with um, <coughs> the same, uh, same meta variable for that. And so what's the, what's the typing rule here? So E has type exon, but now we can be a little bit more precise. We'll say E has type exon singleton E, because we actually know what exception it's going to be. <coughs> um, if we have a V which uh, is of type uh, exon E's for some collection of E's, then rays will have T E's of A, so we know that the exception that's thrown by this must be one of the, uh, one of the ones that V might evaluate to. 
And now for this, we've got some, we've got some choices, but um, let's have epsilon here and epsilon primed here. Then the whole thing, well, what can the effect be? Well, uh, anything n can do, this might do if, if m throws, can throw the exception, but the simple, so we'll, we'll do the uh, course rule to start with. So the course rule is that this can throw anything that m can throw except e, so we can take away the guy that we, um, we put in, and then we can union in whatever n might do. Okay, so, um, so the typing rule for handler, a simple-minded typing rule for handler, looks like this. So the, the possible exceptions thrown by this are the ones thrown by m, take away uh, e, union with the ones uh, possibly thrown by n. Yes? Yeah, that E on the top. There's an E in the premise that is not used in conclusion. Uh, yeah, E, the first, the first premise. Uh, this is, sorry, sorry, sorry. This is only but one. These are <laughs> separate rules. <laughs> sorry. <coughs> right. So no, this is a, this is just an axiom. Um, the uh, the uh, the constant exception E has type X in of E, and then if V has X in of E's, then raise V has type T E's to A. Okay. Um, yes. It doesn't make sense to identify the, uh, the monad with the empty set with just identity monad, or what happens if we end up with the empty set well, the empty in, the set, in, the, in the set of exceptions? Um, yes, we, so, so, so the empty set will be, uh, uh, will be an important one. Um, yes, because uh, that, that will be effectively the identity monad, and there'll be a whole bunch of transformations which are valid for computations which you can prove are in the empty set, um, uh, have, have the empty set of effects. Um, yes. So, uh, so, so yes. If you imagine that we were going to take each one of these things and actually work out what the monad was, which we will in a minute, um, then, then yes, the empty set will correspond to the identity monad. Absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, so how do we give this thing um, a semantics? <coughs> I think I actually have a slide at this point. <coughs> so. Um, so this is, the, this is the sort of the general pattern that we're going to follow. So the idea is what we could do with this language is we could rush off and we could go and try and build a semantics from scratch for this language that was all specialized to this. But this seems an unsatisfactory way of doing it because what we really want is we want to, we want to justify that this is an analysis of the program we started with. Okay, we, want to, we don't want to make a more complicated semantics. We want to say something about the semantics of the programs we already had. Um, we don't want to keep changing the, changing the rules every time we have a new... Um, a new analysis. So the general pattern is going to look like this. We're going, to take, we're going to take our base language, the unrefined language, and give it this base semantics, which in this case just involves uh, uh, sets and functions. And now we've got this refined semantics, the thing I got by adding in all the, uh, all the epsilons in various places. And we're going to interpret the um, judgments in the refined semantics as re binary relations over the unrefined semantics. Okay, just like in my first example of the, the, the programs with only one variable in. And the basic correctness result is going to be that when you have uh, a refined typing judgment, then the semantics of the program you started with is in the diagonal of uh, the relation that's associated with that um, refined type. And that will, that will allow us to perform um, equational transformations that depend upon the extra information that we gathered from the refined type system. So in this case, it's nice and easy. <coughs> so um, oh, I'll move over to the left side of the board again, actually, because then I'll give slightly more people can see. So here, our underlying uh, TA, um, uh, semantically speaking, is just going to be uh, A plus um, epsilon. Okay, so that's, 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 our, that's our unrefined um, thing. And um, what we're going to do is we're going to um, interpret each of our ty each of our refined types as um, as uh, partial equivalence relations, in fact, over the semantics of our unrefined types. So again, we'll have um, uh, maybe I'll use semantic brackets instead of um, uh, instead of uh, our. Um, uh, maybe I'll regret this. No, I'll use R's. I think it's easier. So R, 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 so, the, so we're going to have binary relations indexed by our refined types. So R of int will be, once again, just the diagonal relation on the integers. Um, 
R of now, now our refined type for, exi uh, for exceptions, so if I have uh, uh, Xn of, um, of epsilon, where epsilon is a set of exceptions, oh, yes, mm, right, something else I should have said. Um, so R of Xn epsilons <coughs> uh, is going to be the diagonal relation, but just on the exceptions in here, okay? So this is going to be the set of uh, E, E, such that E is in epsilon. <coughs> And pairs are going to go uh, pairwise functions a arrow p epsilon b <coughs> is going to be a set of f and f prime <laughs> such that <coughs> for v v prime in oh, oh, in R of uh, oh okay look. So we'll have the set of pairs of functions here such that um, whenever you give, uh, have a pair of, of values which are related at, at A, um, F of A and F prime of A primed are in, <coughs> now, R of T epsilon of um, What do I want to say about this? What do I want to say about this? Um, uh, of B, really. <coughs> and <coughs> R of T epsilon of A, which remember this is going to be um, a subset of, um <coughs> so this is actually a refined type, that's why this doesn't really work. Um, I wish I'd use different letters now for the uh, for the refined types because I'm going to. Uh, this is going to be a subset of. Um, So, uh, so right. So x. So, so, so actually, of course, this thing all goes inductively. So the, um, so the, uh, uh, the type, the um, the type t epsilon x x itself is a refined type. So I need to be able to talk about the underlying type, the unrefined type that corresponds to it. So, so if a is the a is the um, is the type that you get by removing any epsilons from x. So if this was, uh, well, okay. So it's good. So. Anyway, so the, uh, the meaning of the computation type T epsilon of X is going to be a binary relation on the meaning of uh, T A, which is the meaning of A plus E, meaning of A plus E. <coughs> and that's going to be <coughs> the set of all in left A, in left A primed, such that <coughs> um, A, A primed is in... Um, R of X. <coughs> so, so related computations of this type are either two things which both evaluate to values uh, uh, in A which are related by uh, the relation associated with X, or it's going to be uh, some in right E and in right E where uh, E is in epsilon. <coughs> okay. Me? Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. So, so there's two approaches we can take. So one is one is one is the sort of synthetic, and the other is the analytic. Right. We can uh, we could we could have stepped back and said, all right, now we we've got we've just got a language which has a more refined type system. Let's build the semantics for the more refined type system from scratch, and, and we could have done that. That would be the building up from the bottom. Okay. And uh, so the the thing I uh, entirely forgot to mention, of course, is that uh, that we that our, our refined type system is just a little bit more complicated than. Um, uh, than uh, 
than I mentioned before, so far, because although the system I gave you works, it turns out to give you very bad effect information, because basically, whenever two things flow to the same place, you have to give them the same effect annotation. Um, so in actual fact, we also have subtyping in, um, in these effect systems. Um, so, um, uh, so, uh, so we have, uh, we have subtyping judgments like this, which sort of say you can always increase the set of possible, um, uh, exceptions and also, uh, go up in the, um, in the type hierarchy. And yes, yeah, so if, we'd, if we had separate monads for each possible thing, then we could indeed model it in a system where we had different monads and we would have a monad morphism uh, uh, witnessing the subtyping judgment that we had, that we had used. But, we don't, but, but what we want to do instead is we want to, to take the semantics that we had already and carve out the well-behaved things. So we're, we're, we're analyzing programs rather than, rather than synthesizing them. Um, and the, the story in, in, the, in the up from the bottom constructive synthetic style gets a bit more complicated when we have more complicated effects that all interact with one another. So, so we're explicitly not doing that. We're taking the semantics we first thought of and then we're trying to carve things out of it. So just like, as I said, with the simply typed lambda characters, we could, we can give an inductive definition up from the bottom and say the interpretation of int is this set, the interpretation of ARB is the interpretation of ARB, interp interpretation of B, and so forth. Or we can start out with a big over generous semantics and we can carve out the semantics of each type as a partial equivalence relation over um, this man, that, that big semantics. Um, so, um, okay. So if we so if, if we set all this up, we end up with a with a, a relation associated um, associated with each one of our refined types, and um, <coughs> the theorem says anything that's well typed in our effect system is um, is in the relation associated with that type. But then we can go off the diagonal, if you like, and we can look at things uh, that things that are being related to uh, to things other than themselves, and uh, we will be able to prove exciting things like uh, oh, what am I talking about? Too many different letters. So now, it, so now we, have a, we can have a, a bunch of syntactic rules which allow us to, to prove uh, program equivalences at a particular type. So in this case, so this rule says, so, and the interpretation of, of, of equals at a type here is being in the relation associated with that type. So if M is a computation with the empty effect and N is a computation with effect epsilon which uh, is typable in a context that doesn't mention X, then let X be M in N is equivalent to N at type T epsilon of Y. Okay, so now, so this, this program transformation, dead code removal, n doesn't mention x, is not generally valid in an ML-like language because the computation m might raise an exception. And so our equational reasoning principle is compromised by the presence of effects in the language. But now we've refined our type system and we've, um, uh, and we've, d uh, we've got a way of saying that some computations actually don't use any effect, then we will be able to perform this rewrite. Okay, so this is the kind of thing that you do in in the compiler, so you, you infer that this thing has no side effects, and consequently you can dead code it if it's not used. And if you can't infer that it doesn't have any side effects, then you have to leave it in the code because um, that's the only way that you can preserve the original behavior of the program. So this one's not very exciting. Um, another one involving, um, involving empty sets, which is a little bit more interesting, is, um, uh, I'll do it the hard way first. So lambda x dot let y be. <coughs> so here, if um, <coughs> what do I mean by it? Gamma X is type X says.
That's right. <coughs> So now if I've got a lambda abstraction, which inside it contains the evaluation of a computation which has no side effects, then I can soundly pull the evaluation of that computation outside the lambda abstraction. So this is something that's, that's, that's often a frightfully good idea because th here this computation M is going to be run every time this function gets applied. Um, and here I've pulled the evaluation of M out um, so that it only happens once and then we return uh, a function which, uh, which just uses the, um, uses the end result every time. So this is generally an improvement unless the function is never called, in which case this is, uh, this is uh, uh, gratuitous work. <coughs> so we can also have equations that involve, um, involve the actual uh, individual exceptions. So uh, if M has type uh, T epsilon of, um, of X uh, and M has type T epsilon times of X, then uh, M to handle T goes to M is just equal to M if uh, E is not in epsilon, for example. So, so we can remove a dead handler, that, uh, so a handler that doesn't, um, uh, uh, that doesn't have uh, any chance of running. So, so we know that the, an upper bound on the side effects of M is epsilon, and epsilon doesn't contain E, so having a handler um, uh, covering that is, is redundant, so we can remove that, um, we can remove that handler. So uh, just to show you that the, um, that the whole business with relations and so forth is actually, um, is actually worth it, we consider uh, lambda f. So here are two functions which uh, have type uh, uh, quite like this. So they take um, they take uh, they t it takes in a, a function f which is from int to to t of int, and the whole thing is of type um, type t of int. Now these two functions are equal if the possible effect of the argument is a single exception. So if we can infer that the argument that's passed to this function, f, has an upper bound on its possible side effecting behavior of just a single exception, the sum, the sum e, such that uh, 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 this thing may raise that exception e, then these two functions are in the relation associated with that type. But they're not in the relation at Okay, so, so this function has this type and this type. This function has this type and this type. But these two functions are equal at this type and they're not equal at this type. So the equality really is a type dependent notion. Okay, <coughs> so that's, uh, that's kind of important. So this is a, this is a, a rather noddy version of effect systems, but we can, we can take the same idea and, um, uh, and apply it to slightly more complicated and interesting things. So, um, so having introduced the idea with exceptions, we talk about store effects, which are a little bit more, bit more challenging to model in this uh, extensional style. So um, I'll start out just by being intuitive. If we, um, <coughs> again, we go back to just, um, just while programs, let's say, operating on two variables. So, so again, we've got an X and a Y, and, um, and our commands are total functions from pairs of integers to pairs of integers. So we take the initial value of X and the initial value of Y and give you back the final value of x and the final value of y. Now our effect system is now going to try and track which variables are possibly read by a command and which possibles are variables are possibly written by a command, okay? So what ones it might depend upon, what ones it might affect. Um, and let's just sort of try naively to, uh, to, uh, to uh, 
to capture that. So, um, so, so, so the sorts of things we, we, we're capturing by our effect system is we're going to have an upper bound on the possible collection of things that it does. So another way of saying it is there are a bunch of uh, effects that are there in the semantics that we're saying this command does not exhibit. So what does it mean not to write to the first location? Um, but fairly easy, right? So, so f has uh, the denotation of, of the command is some f of this type. And um, if it doesn't write to the first location, then we know that f of x, y for any x and y is going to be x and some function of the initial x and y. So it leaves the first thing alone, and it can update the second thing to something which is itself a function of the two initial values. Okay? So if we want to say that c is a command that doesn't read or write the first location, then, well, there's just some function from z to z such that f of x, y is always x, comma, g of y. So this g uh, only depends upon the, uh, the initial value of y. So that's easy. And now, the other sort of thing we want to track is what it means for a command not to read from a particular location. So that means its behavior is independent of the initial contents of that location. But it is allowed to write into that location. And that possibility means that, that um, capturing the behavior of not observably reading from the first location, but possibly writing to, uh, to both of them and possibly uh, reading from the second location. I mean, if we follow this sort of pattern of trying to think about it, we end up with something absolutely disgusting here. Um, <laughs> so it, it, it basically says that, uh, so f, f of x, y is, well, uh, the new value of y will be some function of the initial value of y, and the, um, the new value of x will be either the previous value of x, we leave it unchanged, or it will be some new value. But that new value can only be a function of the initial value of y, and whether or not you do this right or not is itself something that's dependent on the initial value of y. And, uh, and clearly thinking about things in this, uh, in this style is not going to get us anywhere at all. Um, so... Um, but if, we, if, we, if, we're, if we're sort of used to the idea of using these uh, relational reasoning principles, now it turns out we can, we can capture those things just, just dramatically more straightforwardly. So, um, so I've already shown you how we can lift relations uh, up through the uh, arrow and, uh, and product constructor, and I'll use delta for the diagonal relation. And using, using that notation, these, these, properties, these three properties can be captured in a very straightforward fashion. So C doesn't write to the first location, means that for any relation on integers uh, that is contained within the diagonal relation, f will take pairs of states that are related by r cross delta. So delta means equal, and r means so these are, these are the relation between pairs of pairs of, state of, of integers where the first components are related by r and the second components have to be equal. It says, oops, if you, um, if you, uh, if you start me off with, with pairs um, which are, are related like that, then you're guaranteed to get uh, result pairs that are related like that. So this, uh, so this basically says that uh, you have equal things in the second place, and afterwards you'll still have equal things. Um, and whatever relation you had between the first guys will be preserved. Um, sorry, yes, whatever, sorry, you don't write. Whatever relation you have in the first guy will be preserved, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, you'll take equal things in the second position to uh, equal things in the second position. If you don't read or write the first location, then that's the same as preserving any relation at all on the first location. So the point here is that um, th because we say um, these things could be in any relation, it says if, we, if it suffices for them to be equal in the second place, for the second place to be equal. So this, this allows the first things to be different, okay? And that, the fact that if the first things are different, we're still guaranteed to get equal things in the second place, tells us that we can't possibly have extensionally read the first thing to decide what to do in the, in the second. And not reading, the difficult one, turns out to correspond to preserving all relations that are bigger than the identity relation. So this looks very, um, uh, very, very slick compared to what we had on the previous slide. Um, and in fact, the way that this arises is, um, is quite uniform. So I'm going to do the same sort of thing as I did over here, but the, the effect system is just a little bit more uh, interesting in its semantics. So I've got slides for this. So this I think I don't need to dwell on. Our base language, our unrefined language, is the same computational meta language as we've had before, except that now our effects, instead of being raise and handle, we have uh, read of some location and write a value into some location. So our two effects are read and write on some, some collection of global storage cells. Standard typing rules for this, the unrefined type system, is exactly as it has been in all these other slides. So we've got all the rules for the meta language, and then read of L is a computation that returns an integer. And if v is a value of type uh, integer, then write of l and v is a computation that returns a unit. And uh, that has the usual, uh, the usual store passing semantics. So uh, uh, 
computational functions, T of A is just S arrow S cross A, where S is uh, locks to locks to Z. <coughs> so now here are our refined types, following the same pattern as we have with exceptions. So now refined types uh, X arrow T epsilon of Y, where epsilon is some subset of things of the form R of L and W of L. So this means reads some particular location and this means writes some particular location. And this was what I forgot to mention when I talked about exceptions. We have a subtyping system which looks like so. Um, it's the usual thing. Subtyping is transitive. It's uh, reflexive. Um, it goes pointwise through, um, through pairs. Uh, it has the usual contra co behavior on function types. So notice X primed has to be a subtype of X and T epsilon Y has to be a subtype of T epsilon primed Y primed, matching the positive and negative positions in the arrow type. And the thing I had up there for, uh, for effectful computations. So T, T epsilon of X can, is a subtype of T epsilon primed of X primed just when epsilon is a subset of epsilon primed. So you can always increase the, the, um, the set of effects soundly and you can also increase um, uh, uh, X, which itself is, a, is going to come hereditarily from uh, increasing sets of exceptions within that type. <coughs> so here's our refined typing system. This looks, uh, looks like you'd expect. So VAL has the empty effect. Uh, a let unions the effects from M and, uh, and N. Um, here we've typed conditionals requiring the effects of the two branches to be the same, which you can always make happen by using the, uh, the subtyping rule. Reading some location is a computation which has the effect of reading that location. Likewise, writing some location has the effect of writing that location and returns unit. And we can use the subtyping judgment either on values or on computations. So now here's the semantics of our refined types. And now this, this, so this U is this thing which is taking me from refined types to their underlying types, which I uh, um, didn't describe terribly well before. So base types are interpreted by, by diagonal relations. Um, products and functions are represented by the lifting of products and functions to relations the way I described before. And now here's the meaning of, uh, of our store effects. So the meaning of T epsilon of X is going to be a binary relation on um, S arrow S cross the meaning of the underlying type of X, okay? And what it is, this is going to be the collection of functions that whenever you give them states that are related by R, give you back new states that are related by R and values that are related by the meaning of type X for every relation in some collection of relations which are associated with the type X. Uh, with, the, uh, with the effect annotation epsilon. So epsilon is going to govern the collection of relations on the store, which computations of that, uh, of T epsilon, have to preserve. Okay. So what are, what are these sets R epsilon? Well, they are subsets of uh, their relations on, on, the, on the store. And the relation associated with an epsilon, and epsilon is a set of effects. This is the intersection of a bunch of sets of effects one of uh, a set of effects associated with each primitive effect in the set epsilon. So we intersect over all uh, E in epsilon, the collection of relations associated with E. And the collections of relations associated with each individual effect are given down here. So the collection of relations associated by reading a location L are all those relations on states such that if you're in the relation, if two states S and S prime are in the relation, then S and S prime agree on the location L. And the collection of relations associated with writing a location L is a collection of all those relations such that if you're in the relation and you then, so S and S prime are in the relation, and then you take any value N and you update both the state on the left and the state on the right with that value N in place L, then you end up with two new states and those are in the relation still. So, so, so these, are, these are the relations where when you, when you read location L you get equal values and these are the relations such that if you're in the relation and you write equal values into L, you're still in the relation. Okay? So, so for each little e, for each individual ex effect, we have a big collection of relations. And then for epsilon, we're going to intersect all those sets. So the, so the more effects you possibly have, the more sets you're intersecting together, so the smaller the collection of effects that you get, the collection of relations you get for R epsilon. And therefore, the smaller the collection of relations that you have to preserve. So the idea is, so, so when this is empty, you'll have all relations. 
And uh, when this is uh, read and write anything at all, you'll pretty much end up with uh, just having to preserve the identity relation on the state. But when you can possibly do some reads and possibly do some writes, then uh, you'll have some, uh, uh, some set of relations in between that you, that you preserve. And um, oh, I think we'll have an explanation. There we are. Um, uh, right, so, so the way of understanding this is that the collection of relations here in RL, this is the collection of relations which um, are preserved by the operation of reading the store in location L. Okay, so the idea is that, that you, will get, you will get equal, so this uh, reading the location will, will land you up in type int, because when you read a location you get back an integer, and this is the collection of, of stores, uh, of pairs of stores, such that if you read L you get related things at type int, which is the type you want to get to when you do a read. And likewise here, this is a collection of relations that are preserved by the operation of writing related values, in this case related values at type int are just equal values, to location L. If you're in that, if you're in that relation and you, you do related writes, you write, you write um, uh, equivalent values into that location, you're still in the relation. So the way this intersection should be thought of is you preserve all the relations that are preserved by all the operations that you're allowed by your effect refined type. Okay. <coughs> so, we say if we uh, if we if we take this semantics, then there are a bunch of kind of standard boring things that are true of it. If x is a subtype of y, then the interpretation of x as a relation is contained in the interpretation of y. Um, if something is well typed in the uh, in the effect type system, then it's related to itself by the appropriate relation. Um, there's a sanity check if you uh, if you take some type and you put the top effect. I could read and write anything at all uh, in there, then the interpretation of that is just the diagonal relation on the interpretation of the underlying type. Um, and then we can prove a whole bunch of equivalences. So we have, because we've set our syntax up in this computational metalanguage style, we have all the usual full beta and eta rules for, uh, for pairs and, uh, and functions and so forth, and commuting conversions for both the computation type and for coproducts. But then we have a bunch of effect-dependent rewrites where we actually use the extra information that we gathered using this, uh, this static analysis. And uh, here are some examples. So this is dead code again, just like we had for, uh, for, the, effect is for the exception <laughs> system uh, for, uh, 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 for this effect system too. Um, you can dead code things, but here you can dead code something slightly different. So, uh, so here, if I've got some m which has t epsilon and n which has t epsilon primed and x is not mentioned in n, then let x be m in n is just equal to n. I can dead code m if the collection of things which are written in m is empty. So it's sound to dead code something that reads the store, but if it does some writes, you better not get rid of it. Okay. So here's more interesting ones, duplicated computation. So here on the, on, the, on the top, we've got let x be m in let y be m in n, and that's going to be equivalent to let x be m in n with um, x for y. So I'm replacing two evaluations of the same thing with just one, and that's a valid thing to do if m has type t epsilon of x, where the collection of things that are read in epsilon intersect the collection of things that are written in epsilon is empty. So this one's already not completely obvious. So the idea is M, M can have effects. It can, it can read some bunch of the store and it can write some, some bit of the store. But if its reads and writes are disjoint, um, then whatever writes it does to the store um, uh, the first time round, uh, it, will it must make the same writes to the store the second, the second time round because it only read things that it didn't change between the two evaluations. Okay. So we can prove that this equation holds uh, by showing that these two things are in the relational interpretation of this type, provided that this condition is, uh, is, uh, is, is true. So we've got throwing things away, we've got duplicating things, and then the other thing we might want to do is swap them. Um, so here's the rule for commuting com computations. So here, let x be m1 and let x2 be m2, and here's the same thing with the, uh, with the um, evaluation swapped around. And that sound, if, well, what do we need? We need that the rights of the two things are disjoint and that the reads of one are disjoint from the rights of the other. Um, so again, it's a, a not entirely uh, immediately obvious condition, but, uh, but that's the right thing. So, uh, so they don't interfere with one another. And we can prove that this is a, a valid transformation. And again, the pure lambda uh, uh, hoist transformation. So if we have some computation which is entirely pure inside um, a lambda abstraction, then we can pull it out of the lambda abstraction um, in this case. Okay, 
So I think I'm going to, yeah, it's all right. I'm going to try and do this. So that was, that was, that was for a language with, um, with global store. Now, now I'm going to kind of just try and sketch how this extends to a language with dynamic allocation. Because um, nobody really has an effect system for something quite as simple as this with global variables. But the, the basic principle is, uh, is the same. <coughs> so now I'm going to take a language which has, uh, has ML-like references. <coughs> so, um, <coughs> I'm not quite sure why that's uh, gamma x, but never mind. So now we can no longer in our static analysis mention all the locations that are going to occur at runtime because we're going to be dynamically allocating new ones. Um, so previously we had read x and write, uh, and write y in the type system because x and y could be named statically before we start to run the program. Uh, but here uh, we've got dynamically allocated references so we can't name them all in advance. So instead we're going to use regions. Um, so regions are going to be a static approximation of sets of things which are evaluated at, that are generated at runtime. So now our, accepts, our effects will look like they did before. We'll have read of R, write of R, and this new one, allocate of R. And then these things are indexed <laughs> not by actual locations, but by approximations of those, which, which we'll, we'll call regions. So there'll be some collection R of regions, and, uh, and we'll have effects of sets of reading, writing, and allocating in all of those. So the type rules for the, re for the analysis are very straightforward. So um, if you uh, generate a new uh, reference, uh, so ref of R make returns a new, um, so ref of X returns a, a new reference in region R um, with initial contents X, and it has the side effect of allocating in region R. Um, and uh, X gets Y uh, has type unit and the side effect of writing to region R if, uh, if X is a, a reference in region R and Y is a, um, an integer. And then here, this is the, um, this is the exciting one. So now, gamma says E has type A and effect epsilon. So A is going to be one of our effect annotated types, and uh, uh, epsilon is going to be, in effect, a set of these things. And the region R doesn't occur anywhere in gamma or in A. So uh, E can have some effects which involves reading and writing to lots of different locations, uh, at lots of different regions, but there's one region R which it might, it might have some effects in, but that region R is not mentioned uh, uh, in, in A itself, the return type, or in anything in the context. If that happens, then this is a rule that lets us actually make the effect smaller. We can, we can soundly say gamma says E has type A in epsilon, take away any effect in region R. And this is called effect masking. And this is the effect system thing that corresponds to that run ST um, operation in Haskell that I was talking about um, uh, a couple of days ago. So uh, the idea is that, um, that this region R, um, it doesn't, uh, it's not mentioned anywhere in the, in the context, anywhere outside. So, so this E, um, you must be able to, to, to run the computation, if you like, by kind of uh, creating a fresh region, um, doing, doing all the computation in that region, and at the end of the day, you get some value A, which will have no further, further use for that computation, uh, and you won't have messed with anything uh, uh, from the context because none of those things mentioned, uh, mentioned are. So whatever action you had in region R is completely invisible to the outside world um, and so you needn't mention it to the outside world. And that's going to help a lot because we're going to be able to write programs that uh, generate, some, generate some new imperative state, do some computations with them and then finally return values that behave purely functionally just as we could in, the, in Haskell using run ST. So <coughs> how do we do this? So we do the same thing as we did before, but it's just a little bit more complicated to cope with the fact that we've got dynamic allocation around. So instead of having uh, just a fixed relation for each type, we're going to have a parameterized relation. So this is like what I was talking about yesterday, but a little bit simpler, so hopefully it will, uh, it will make sense. So, um, so here we're not going to try and do uh, any fancy stuff with FM sets or anything. We're going to be explicit about, um, about what we're considering equivalent on the two sides of our evaluation, which locations correspond to one another on the two sides of the, um, of the equation. So, so a parameter here, phi, is going to uh, give you a partial bijection on the collection of uh, locations uh, for each, uh, each region. So the picture is... <coughs> so we're going to have sort of uh, R1. We'll have some, some bunch of things. And then R2 we'll have some bunch of things, and R3 will have some bunch of things. OK? 
Okay. <coughs> so, so the idea is, each of our each of our different regions, we're going to say we're going to talk about we're going to say this location. If, if you consider this location on the left hand side of evaluation and this location on the right hand side of evaluation to be the ones that are supposed to match up. Okay, so this is going to allow us to deal with the fact that we don't care about exactly what, what values we use in locations. We're independent of, of, um, of, of exactly which locations are returned by, uh, returned by the allocator. So, uh, so each region gets a partial bijection attached to it, which says which references are, are to be considered um, uh, equivalent on the two sides of our relation. And then, given one of these parameters, um, a relation on states... Um, is, uh, uh, is supported by two sets of locations, L and L primed, and this is simpler than what I did, did yesterday, just when, but it's similar, um, when if you're, uh, if you're in the relation and uh, you have a state which is equivalent to the guy on the left at all the things in L and equivalent to uh, the guy on the right at all the things in L primed, uh, then you stay in the relation. <coughs> and then we define what it means for one of these state relations to respect a particular effect. And this is just like what we did before, but we've got this extra information around about, um, about partial bijections that say which locations are to be considered equivalent. So our respect reading at some parameter phi, just if when you're in, uh, in, in, the, in the relation R uh, and you look up L and now L primed for any L and L primed which are in phi of R. So the partial bijection says, now we're not got, we haven't got global variables, X and Y, we're going to have uh, dynamically allocated things, L and L primed, on the two sides. And so the parameter says, if you consider these guys to be the ones that match up, then you should get equal values when you read uh, S at L and S primed at L primed. And R respects writing in region R, if whenever you have two locations which phi says uh, match up, so the parameter tells you again which things match up on the two sides, then if you write equal values on the left into L and on the right oops, into L primed, then you stay in the relation. And we'll say the relations all respect allocations. <coughs> so, uh, <coughs> then uh, the collection of relations associated with a particular effect, remember this is reading, writing, and allocating in some uh, uh, in, in some collection of regions, will be the collection of all relations on the state uh, which are supported by um, uh, the locations mentioned in the parameter, such that R respects E, in this sense, for every E in the set of effects. And I'll skip that. And now uh, we, do, we do the same thing. We're going to have the meaning of our, of our effect-refined types, but now it's going to be parameterized by this this parameter which tells us uh, which things on, on the two sides are supposed to be, uh, to be equivalent. <coughs> and uh, so it's diagonal relation on, uh, on the ground types. Um, at reference types, so what is it to be equal things of type ref R in a parameter phi? Well, they're the things that phi says are supposed to be equal. So phi of R is this partial bijection which says which locations on the left and which locations on the right are to be considered to match up. And so, uh, so the binary relation here on the collection of all, re of all references uh, at region R is just phi of R, okay, it's this partial bijection. For products, we do the producty thing. Uh, for functions, we do equal related arguments to related results. Um, but just as yesterday, because we've got dynamic allocation, the functions um, may be called later than now um, in a world where more references have been allocated. So these partial bijections are going to grow. Every time we do, a, uh, do an allocation on the two sides, we will add new locations into this parameter. So new things will have to match up. And the functions have better behave themselves when they're called in the future, when more stuff has been allocated. So we have to quantify here over all extensions. So phi primed greater than phi means exactly what you expect. You take these partial bijections for each, um, for each region and you add new links in uh, uh, into, uh, to any of those. So, so it says for all phi primed extending phi, if you have x and x primed that are related at type A um, with parameter phi primed, then f of x and f primed of x primed have to be in the meaning of T epsilon of B at uh, phi primed. And T epsilon of some uh, relation at phi is, ignore this for the minute, it says whenever you have got, um, 
uh, and this just well forwardness it says for any relation in the collection of relations to be preserved by effect epsilon but now index extra by by this phi <coughs> which we passed in by the parameter then if you have related states beforehand then you'll have related states afterwards and um, there will be some extension to the parameter you started with such that if you've ex if if so so this psi if psi of r is n is um, is not empty so this extension is going to add new links into the partial bijections in some places and what this says is that this psi is the extension it says anywhere where you've extended it where you've actually added new links that reference had better show up in the allocate and the allocation effect of the epsilon so so for reads and writes we're talking about uh, uh, which states are related and um, and for allocation we're saying uh, that the um, uh, that the parameter is only allowed to evolve in a way that matches the effect annotation that we had on the computation so we start um, uh, so uh, yes yeah, so we started with our related states and we ended up with um, uh, with our related states and the new states will be equal on all the new um, locations that we allocated um, and the values themselves will be related by the relation that we passed in here at the new world. So, so we started out in a world phi and we moved forward to a world um, a phi disjoint union psi and, um, and the return values are related in the new world so they can refer to the newly allocated things. And this QPER is just a closure operator that's in there for, for technical reasons. So, um, so there we go. So, this, uh, so using, using this semantics, we get all the usual uh, uh, fundamental theorem and so forth. We get all the effect-based transformations that we had for the language with global store, but they now work uh, for this language with dynamic allocation. Um, though there are some slight changes to the rules. So the duplicated computation rule is the interesting one. So if you run, the rule I had before was that if you, have, if you run a computation m once and then run it tw the second time, that's uh, equivalent to just running it once and using the value twice if the reads and the writes of that um, computation were disjoint. But in the dynamic allocation case, there's a further... Um, uh, restriction there, which is that the thing must do no allocations. So if you have a computation that does some allocations, then when you run it twice, you get, uh, you, you possibly get, uh, uh, well, I'll give an example. You get things which behave uh, differently. <coughs> so, um, so something like, um, uh, uh, So here's a counter, right? So, so, so this is a computation which has the effect of allocating a new, a new reference cell, and then it returns a pure value which itself has the effect of reading and writing, but this, this lambda abstraction is a, is a pure value. But you certainly, you certainly can't run this twice and get, so if, if, you, uh, if I say let um, um, uh, f equal uh, m, f primed equal uh, um, uh, M uh, in P, then that's not going to be the same as let uh, uh, F be uh, M in P with um, F for F primed, right? So, so although this thing doesn't read and write uh, any store directly, I certainly can't um, uh, uh, remove duplicated applications because uh, the duplicated applications give me two independent counter objects, whereas one one run only gives me one counter object. So, um, so if, I, if I call this one and then this one and then call this one, I'll get one, one, two. Whereas if I do it this way, I'll get one, two, three. Um, so, uh, so the side condition on duplicated computation is that uh, the reads and writes are disjoint and there's no allocation. Okay, so, uh, so this is uh, relational parameters. It gives you an elegant and useful extensional semantics to these, uh, to these effect systems. And uh, so we've, we've done sort of fancier... Uh, fancier system for exceptions that has uh, effect polymorphism in and so forth, um, and for <coughs> global higher order store when you can have references in the uh, in the heap, and uh, and we're currently working on a, an abstract notion of this that's a, a bit a bit less concrete about what regions actually uh, uh, refer to. 
And uh, what I'd like to point out is that, uh, that yes, this, this, the fundamental slogan of preserving all relations that are preserved by all the operations is exactly what we were doing uh, yesterday as well in the semantics of the, in the, in the more accurate semantics of the, um, of, the, uh, of the effectful language. So I shall stop there. Questions? <coughs> Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, uh, that's the remark. Your, your last system, you, you, didn't, you expressed it in, in just with the effects, not with refined ones. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. I could have done, yes, yes, yes. After a while, you realize the syntax doesn't matter so much, so you don't tend to be consistent. Yes, that's right, yes. Yeah. Uh, then I had a, a more uh, yeah. important question. So the, 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 usually, when, when you use Sub, a sub collection of contextual equivalent. Mm -hmm. So, what are the contextual equivalent? Uh, yeah, yeah, so you phrase this in, in terms of contextual equivalent. Yeah, yeah, all these, these, yeah these, these guys are, yes, these guys are contextual equivalences. Um. I'm refining the context, you see. That's the, that's the point of the effect system. It says, it's, uh, it takes the, the language that's originally formulated allows any effect anywhere. And now we're saying, well, this thing only has these effects. And this thing is equal to this thing in a context where you only pass it arguments that only have these effects. Um, Yes. 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 So, 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 so now this, uh, so, so yeah, these, these two terms are, the, are terms from the old language, but, but the theta and the, and the x are, type, are refined types. So we're saying, we're saying yes, that they're, they're, they're equal in, in the refined context where you, where you, where you guarantee to give them uh, uh, things which uh, have these refined types here. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I mean, not using the context in the sense of setup, uh, yes, yes, but in yes, the sense of it in sense pro. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Um, I mean, uh, oh, but the other thing I should say is that this is not part of the benefit of doing it this this strongly extensional way, um, uh, rather than doing something more vulgar like kind of just looking at traces of evaluations and seeing whether there were any reads and writes in them and things, um, is that. Um, that this, this relational interpretation holds for things which we can't type using, this. so there is an actual property of programs which we're capturing with this uh, relational uh, reading, and the type system really is only an approximate way of discovering when terms have that property. So you can, um, you can go away and do some calculation in the semantics using whatever method you like, to prove that some terms are in the, in the interpretation of these types, even when this type system, the syntactic rules, is in are insufficiently powerful to, um, to validate it. And that's actually, that's actually a major reason for doing things in, in this style, because we quite often have, uh, well, for example, in our compiler, we have, we have this sort of system for analyzing user programs, and then we have some bits of library code, which we have manually annotated with uh, more refined effects than would be given to them by this static analysis because this is really very simple-minded. But we can go away and do the calculation and show that they really do have that, um, uh, that effect in terms of that. And, and we know that they will then play nice and all the compiler transformations and so forth will all still be valid. And that wouldn't be the case if we had um, tried a, an interpretation that was, was more intentional and, and only captured the things that this syntactic type system could discover. So, so the, uh, the, the semantics is kind of deeper and more... Um, uh, uh, more powerful than the actual syntactic type rules that I'm, I'm giving you here. Um, so, for example, this system is not uh, is not strong enough to show that um, uh, a memo function, for example, would be sort of the classical uh, classical example. Um, so, um, so memo f um, it wants to take. So 
So, so memo is a thing which has got a reference cell inside it to store an argument and a result for, for, for some function. And if you call, if you call memo uh, giving it function f, which is itself pure, um, then this thing will give you back a new function, which is also pure from the outside. And, every and in fact, the idea is that every time you call this function with an argument, you get the same thing as f would have given you. But if you happen to call it with the same argument as you used last time, then uh, you'll look it up in a reference cell rather than actually calling f. And um, this thing, if you've implemented it correctly, will have this type. If, you give, if we assume that the function you pass in is pure, we need to be able to say that because a memo function doesn't work if you pass it an impure function. So, so the extra refinement is useful just to even write the specification. But then you want to say that there's no observable effect from the outside when you call memo. It doesn't actually do anything that you can detect um, in any context. Now, our static analysis here is far too weak uh, uh, to actually prove that an implementation of memo involving reference cells has this type. The implementation of memo has some reads and writes in it and they'll be flagged up in this system. But if you take the semantics of memo and you do a little calculation, you can prove that it's actually in the interpretation of this type. And then it's sound to, to annotate it with that type and let that, uh, let that play with things that are inferred by this system and have all the optimizing transformations run. Um. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a change of program. Uh, we will have the talk last at two o'clock. And at four o'clock, uh, Benjamin has agreed to give uh, a lecture on creativity, sensitivity, and surprise. <laughs> Should I say two words about that too? So, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, in the times of day when I'm not a computer scientist, sometimes I'm a photographer. And uh, last year, uh, the organizers of the Uppsala Splash Conference uh, asked me to come and give a, a, a keynote talk to Uppsala about photography. Uh, having something to do with computer science. So, uh, so the talk that um, uh, people have asked for a reprise of this afternoon was the, uh, was, is that talk was the result of trying to figure out uh, what does creativity in the visual arts have to do with creativity uh, in, uh, in computer science. And so it's a, it's a talk about photography. It's not a talk about computer science, but I hope you'll see connections.